I'm going to kick this off. Uh, thank you, guys. Uh, welcome to another session of Raising Products, our fourth in a series. Um, I first off would like to thank our panelists for joining us, who will be introduced shortly. Thank you again to the Design Museum Chicago for creating such awesome platforms for design to do what it do. <laughs> Raising Products is about making, unmaking, and remaking. The primary objective is threefold. To illuminate the design process, provide economically valuable and pragmatic skills, and establish a creative outlet. We wholeheartedly believe that design can be an agent of change that uplifts and transforms marginalized communities. Black House Studios is a Chicago-based, socially-focused design studio founded in 2016. Uh, <clears throat> and dedicated to using design as an agent of change and uplifting and transforming marginalized communities. Uh, we strive for our work and presence in the design profession to instigate, uh, uh, <laughs> instigate greater inclusion of black and brown narratives in the history of design and promote design's relevance to contemporary communities of color. I'm gonna talk a little bit about our moderator tonight. Thank you so much, Camila Rashid. Camila Rashid is an arts administrator, writer, educator, art, and artist that has worked from every angle of cultural production with almost two decades of experience in new program development, arts education, and outreach, community-based programming, and public engagement. Desiring to leave the conventional assumptions about about what defines high art, whom it is for, and how it can be engaged. Her work is often place-based and socially concerned. Camila has contributed to new and ongoing programs at numerous arts organizations in Chicago, including the Arts Institute of Chicago, Illinois Humanities, Stony Island Arts Bank, Young Chicago <coughs> Arthurs, and Chicago Shakespeare Theater, among others. Rashid is currently the Director of Education at Court Theater, the professional theater of the University of Chicago. Thank you so much, Camila, and to our wonderful panelists for making time to think with us. Turn it over to Camila. Hi, everybody. Good evening. Hey. Waving to you in, in the virtual world where you are, waving to our panel. Wish I could be in the same room with you, so just know I'm sending you good vibes. Um, I have a lot of natural light where I live, so I'm not trying to be dramatic um, <laughs> or, new, or to give you a noir feeling, but you will see the sunset out my window as we talk this evening. Uh, I'm going to begin uh, just by saying thank you for joining us. Um, welcome to Raising Products, this virtual conversation series about making and unmaking and the role that art and design plays in building power in communities of color. Um, throughout this conversation, we're going to be weaving together how a myriad of stakeholders, both public and private and otherwise, can play a role in more equitable world building um, and in communities of color in particular. Uh, before we get into that, I want to introduce this really amazing panel that I'm so privileged to speak with this evening I'm in conversation with all of you. Uh, I'm going to do this in alphabetical order, and um, when I kind of share a little bit about you, please wave, I guess, or indicate to the public that that's you um, so that they're aware. Um, uh, Maurice Cox is responsible for leading the City of Chicago Department of Planning and Development's economic development, planning, and zoning functions, while fostering community improvement initiatives throughout the city. His primary focus is underinvested neighborhoods on the south and west sides of Chicago. As Director of Planning and Development for the City of Detroit, Cox created a new resident-centered planning and development department, and while there, spearheaded revitalization strategies that championed equitable redevelopment. A native of Brooklyn, he has a Bachelor of Architecture degree from the Cooper Union in New York City and an honorary doctorate degree from the University of Detroit Mercy. Tony L. Griffin is the founder of Urban AC, that's Urban American City, LLC, a planning and design management practice that works with public, private, and nonprofit partnerships to, re to reimagine, reshape, and rebuild just cities and communities based in New York. Recent clients include the cities of Chicago, St. Louis, Philadelphia, 
Pittsburgh, Milwaukee, Memphis, and Detroit. Ms. Griffin is also a professor of practice of urban planning at the Harvard Graduate School of Design and is the founder and director of the Just City Lab, an applied research platform that investigates the ways design can positively impact conditions of injustice in cities. And last but certainly not least, Brandy T. Summers, PhD, is assistant professor of geography and global metropolitan studies at the University of California, Berkeley. Her book, Black in Place, The Spatial Aesthetics of Race in a Post-Chocolate City, explores how aesthetics and race converge to matte blackness in Washington, DC. Her current research explores placemaking practices and how they can inform the production of knowledge and power in Oakland, California. Dr. Summers has published several articles and essays that analyze the relationship between race, power, aesthetics, and urbanization that appear in both scholarly and popular publications, including the New York Times, the Boston Globe, among many others. Please give up you know, a virtual applause to this incredible panel. I just want to offer them a warm virtual welcome. Um, this in no way is, uh, exhausts the, uh, the complete breadth of experience that this panelists, uh, these panelists have. So we're going to drop a link in the chat um, that you can um, follow if you want to see the full bios um, that are quite um, extensive and distinguished for these panelists. Uh, if we're all ready to go, uh, we can get into a, a, a few questions uh, for the panel. Let me look at their faces. <laughs> I see you horizontally I'm like, let me look at your faces. Do you look ready? Okay. Uh, collectively, this esteemed panel thinks about space and place in a really multidimensional way. And when thinking about the best way to weave together so much beautiful thought work, um, the Bauhaus felt natural to me um, and the most natural touchstone to frame our conversation about design and the architecture of social responsibility, how that impacts place and the people who inhabit that place. So we're not going to be doing a, a short lecture on the Bauhaus, but I will be referencing it um, to kind of frame some of the questions that we're talking about this evening. The first um, section of this conversation I'm calling Black Cartography. Um, Dr. Summers, in some of your work, you kind of describe your work as mapping Blackness, and that really jumped out at me as like a powerful set of words next to one another. Um, when the Bauhaus was founded in 1919, uh, the primary goal was not only to reimagine the aesthetics of the material world through design, but its usefulness and its impact on the quality of people's everyday lives. Aspects of creativity once considered disparate were brought together to sort of rethink our systems of living with the pursuit of a utopian outcome. Um, making a more beautiful world, both tangible, tangibly and figuratively speaking. So I wanted to direct the first question with that in mind um, to Dr. Summers. In your book, um, Black in Place, The Spatial Aesthetics of Race in a Post-Chocolate City, one of the themes explored is the weaponization of Black aesthetics, of urban cool to commercialize and ultimately displace Black people. Um, I hope to imagine with you today the inverse um, in the most liberatory sense possible, considering some of the design principles of the, black, um, of the Bauhaus, what would it look like for us to have a Black house considering how Black aesthetics can inform uplifting design for Black people. Um, if you, Dr. Summers, if you were to speculate on a Black design agenda focused on improving the quality of life for Black Americans across the country in our most populous cities, um, what are some ideas, what are some, some items that might frame that Black design agenda? Thanks for that question, Camila, and, and I'm excited to be on this panel, um, especially because I think of what I wasn't able to do in my book. So I, I think it's a really excellent question um, to look at the inverse. So I was so much focused on understanding not just how Black aesthetics, but Blackness as an aesthetic has this impact on how Washington, D.C. has been planned, um, not only historically, but also kind of contemporarily and how developers are brought in um, to attract tourists and, and new residents who are most often wealthier, whiter, um, younger, uh, single. And so in that way, it didn't, um, or they aren't imagining this future city uh, with Black people in mind to remain, instead using Blackness to um, attract others, right? And so 
To answer your question, I think a lot of it has to do with understanding everyday uses of space and the ways that we don't necessarily have to define Black activity as being exceptional or something that stands out, but instead just look literally at how people use space every day, how Black people use space every day. And we can think about that uh, in terms of architecture. So it doesn't necessarily have to be that a Black person built a structure, but instead to re really understand how they use it. Um, and so that might not have necessarily been the in intention of the designer, but it certainly matters um, just in terms of how that structure, how the built environment can be manipulated um, and really kind of taken over in meaningful ways. And so to think about a black house or to think about um, you know, this concept of black space um, and then also kind of in a smaller dimension, black place, I really want to emphasize the significance of the quotidian. And that's what I'm hoping to do um, in looking at Oakland, which is my hometown, because I see these ways that it might be, you know, in California with this Western expansion, you know, it's never had a tremendously large Black population, but that doesn't mean there haven't been Black cities in California. And so what makes them Black may not necessarily be the number of Black people in the city, but it's literally how you feel when you're there. And so that can really involve vernacular architecture, that can involve various practices, but I really do think that if we kind of have this sense, this spatial imaginary and ways that Black people want to be low Located, then we can kind of use that to drive our interests. That's a, a beautiful answer uh, because I have I have never thought about that is ultimately what designs is mo most predominantly supposed to tackle. Right, it's like everyday practical use. Um, but to be honest, I don't navigate space as a black person who lives in a black community um, that way in terms of like what makes me feel comfortable and, and what is useful to me and how do I need to use my community. So now when I leave my building, I'm going to be thinking about that because of you. I now I want to open this up to our other uh, panelists, Tony and Maurice. Uh, do you have any notions about what should inform a Black agenda around design? And as we think about uh, Black space, um, what should typify something that is considered, you know, on a list of priorities around Black concerns? Tony? I'm on mute, sorry. You could have taken the mic, you're already up. Um, well, you know, I'm from the South Side of Chicago. And so growing up the South Side of Chicago was black space. You know, all my needs were met. Everybody around me was black. A lot, if not most of my teachers were black. Um, my classmates were black. It wasn't until I traveled, you know, 10 miles to get to downtown but I understood that there was another type of space. Um, and so, you know, I agree with Brandy that um, a lot of it is embodied in how we naturally move and feel in spaces where we feel safe, right? And where we feel like we can be ourselves. I, uh, last year, um, put together a convening called the Just City Assembly. And it was a group of um, practitioners in design space and, and around that design space, uh, Maurice um, presented there with the head of the Kresge Foundation and talking about how Detroit was changing. Detroit is the largest black city in the nation um, and talking about how those changes were happening. But in, in the smaller sessions, we had a specific conversation around utopian possibilities. And what does it mean to think about the notion of utopia and justice at the same time as a part of the work, I think to reclaim black space, to legitimize black space and to legitimize blackness in space. And what that, what that conversation yielded was, you know, an answer to your question, which is black space is a second line. Uh, black space is where black folks are liberated and feel liberation, right? And so that doesn't necessarily have a particular aesthetic, which I think Brandy was talking about, um, but it does, it is a type of space that truly allows for the occupation of blackness to be and be legitimized, right? And I think that's some of the tension we find, you know, Brandy's book talks about H Street, I'm living in Harlem, these are changing neighborhoods of which we were both gentrifiers as Black folks in them, right? 
um, and watching my the neighborhood I live in, Harlem, um, introduce its neighbors uh, to the notion of black space by being new people living in it. Just really quickly, so during COVID, we've had open streets as many cities have, and so my block, which is in um, the historic district of Mount Morris Park, applied for open streets. And over the 10 years I've been on this street, it has become more white. <laughs> like we're now the older black folks that live on the block, right? Um, and through the block club, there's been this really interesting way of um, how they're educating their new neighbors about black space, um, how to have an appreciation for the fact that you live in a particular context that has a particular history and narrative and how you embrace that as a part of what you value here as opposed to walking around aimlessly not understanding what it is and because it's different from your culture you feel like it is perhaps not a, an acceptable behavior so i think the more that that gets that practice is put in place which has something to do with designers and also has to do with how people you know take on the work in spaces that we design that i think ultimately creates this thing uh, that we're calling black space Wow. Take a look, Maurice. Yeah. <laughs> um, so I, I, I'm fascinated by this idea of uh, black space and uh, something Tony uh, said that, you know, as she was growing up, you know, the neighborhood on the South Side was a fully functioning community with its own downtown, its own main street, its own parks, uh, and uh, effectively, um, you know, the, the bones of that. Um, still exist and there's still a kind of a yearning and collective memory of that and so people understand uh, the absence of uh, and sorely want some of that back but want it in a kind of 21st century ver version so one of the realities now on the south side and the west side of Chicago and much of Detroit is that there's a no a new spatial form um, as a result of a uh, a selective and sometimes aggressive demolition that creates for an entirely new kind of a landscape form. Uh, so case in point in Detroit, at the center of a quarter square mile area, 95% um, African American was, you know, two dozen vacant lots where there used to be houses that stood. And so our challenge was how do we take this new spatial form and turn it into something productive? How do you turn it into a neighborhood park? And not only how do you, um, so, so this is a park by subtra sub subtraction. Uh, and then how do you get a, a community to own this space? And so in our case in Detroit, it was to invite a renowned African-American local artist to come in and interpret um, something permanent uh, that um, kids and residents could have their fingerprints all over it. And they came up with this 150 foot long ceramic uh, tile um, stepping wall uh, that was collectively made by those residents under the, the uh, ownership of this uh, artists on the guidance of this artist or the simple creation of a basketball court not a half court but a full court in a black neighborhood and just think about the signal that that sent to those young men that you mean my community actually wants us to gather and have a competitive basketball game something that actually had been denied them in the past so it's amazing um, how these clues um, suggest to folks whether you belong or not. And so here in, uh, in Chicago, we are starting to work on those areas that are the front doors of these communities, knowing full well that there's this collective memory, even though we're looking at a fragment of what they were, that these were those designs, these were those downtowns that kind of fed their everyday uh, needs. And we can, um, reinterpret them uh, today. And a lot of our work is trying to re, uh, reorganize 
um, invite the public to engage uh, in the public realm and to take ownership in spaces that they feel uh, comfortable with. Uh, I, you know, I think there's an amazing tradition in Chicago of artists stepping into these spaces, uh, whether it's Amanda Williams painting, you know, painting houses that sit in a certain kind of vacancy um, as kind of reminders of some of our cultural norms. Uh, and, um, and uh, you know, or in Detroit with Tyree Guyton, who makes this amazing scape that is a, a memory place for what that community has lost. So I have found um, having artists in the room, as well as designers, uh, gives us kind of greater kind of interpretive powers, so much so uh, that uh, in partnership with uh, DCASE, which is our cultural arts department, we've just uh, initiated in Chicago an artist in residency program where we select an artist who is from that community to be a co-curator of all of the urban form uh, that will emerge over the next three years. I'm super excited uh, by having that kind of talent in the mix and I think it will help us um, help us un uncover the, the black roots of those spaces by having black artists uh, at the table. That's, uh, my brain is very much percolating around those projects because I've made hundreds of itinerant projects in, in parks, libraries, and schools around Chicago with artists. So, and I'm aware of some of the artists who are gonna be collaborating on that project. So I'm super excited for Chicago. Um, and to, uh, you know, to amplify and uplift what Tony is saying, having grown up in Decatur, Georgia, you know, 30 minutes outside of Atlanta. Um, I feel like, you know, I grew up in a black metropolis. Um, it was jarring for me to go to other cities as an adult and to, to understand that not everybody is living in the same wealth of um, comfort and feeling, um, I think sort of, you know, sort of a wraparound community where uh, all the needs that you have are met. Um, everything that you need is in the proximity of your community. You see black business owners, um, you see black people living in all these different um, uh, all these different ways around you. Um, and so in a way that unconsciously says a lot about what you can be um, mm -hmm. because of what you're seeing reflected. And then certainly growing up in a, leg you know, in a city that has a legacy of John Lewis, that has a legacy of Martin Luther King, um, that has a legacy of you know, HBCUs, I think um, I, I very much took for granted what it meant to be in black space all the time. And it was my presumption before I went to other places in the country that everybody lived like that. <laughs> everybody had that um, right. kind of um, dynamic. And so I think it's really beautiful to see uh, through your intersecting in some ways and disparate work, um, how you are all thinking about that in beautiful ways. I just want to say as a citizen, um, and, and, and Camila, just because um, before we, we went live, um, we learned that you are teaching or doing a residency in the high school I went to, uh, Lynn Bloom Tech. Uh, and that at the time I was there, you know, it was a magnet school. I traveled, you know, two buses and a train uh, to get to my high school. Um, but it was one of the few schools that actually had architecture. So I knew I wanted to be an architect by the time I was 14. Mm -hmm. And so what's interesting, um, or what I think is opportunistic and, and using Maurice's example and the fact that you, you're teaching, you know, art in a school that has architecture as part of its kind of steam, as do others, is how do we now push the agenda on those types of programs to have those young people understand the roles they can play in making black space, yes. right? And so the intersection and the opportunity that you have by being at Lindblom or any school that has the opportunity to fuse these things together so that we're not just teaching people these skills, but we're also teaching young people how to understand that and interpret that through the way in which they move through their own communities every day, participate in the work, you know, that we're trying to do in communities so that they become activists in their own communities. And then think about, you know, pathways to careers uh, that are entrepreneurial or going into other firms 
that allow them to be, you know, civic actors in these black spaces going forward. No one was telling me that when I was in drafting class, <laughs> thinking about building buildings, which I did for a number of years. It was only through a pro bono project uh, while I was working for Skid Moorings in Merrill that I got to work in Chicago for the first time, working in Bronzeville, working on the West Side. I was like, oh my God, like here is the connection between me admiring, you know, Lake Point Tower and the Wrigley Building as a kid and wanting to be an architect to now thinking about how I can apply that uh, on the ground. And so I hope that that's something, if young people are listening, we can begin to um, overlay into these arts programs and disciplines. And so they're coming out and working with Maurice uh, on these projects and thinking about how they can be Maurice or Tony or Brandy uh, in their future with this kind of background. Yeah, to your point, to your point I, I'm just reminded of the work uh, that one of the last neighborhood frameworks we did in Detroit uh, was for an area that had the highest concentration of young people under 18, so much so that I thought we should turn the planning process over to them, uh, and we did that. Uh, so there was a youth council of about 18 young people who took two days out of the week. They took their Saturday mornings for a full year to design every aspect of their community, the housing strategy, the transportation strategy, to watch these young people get up in front of an audience of 200 adults and present their ideas was powerful. By the end of the process, half of them wanted to be urban planners and designers. Uh, and so just that exposure that it was about problem solving and it was problem solving in communities that they love that they intuitively understood, but had no idea that these tools and resources were available to them. Uh, it gave me an enormous uh, sense of confidence that we can share uh, in these public processes that we're asked to manage, to include youth at the center. And by the way, they were incredibly insightful and not very cynical. You know, they come with a, an embedded optimism and that we know 30 years from now, they're gonna be in those communities. Uh, so. I just, as I said, having a window into the kind of superpowers that design gives you and to have those powers discovered at 16, 17 years old is an amazing thing. That's, as I, for a long time, I was like, why am I moderating this conversation? But now I feel like I'm in my pocket. Um, <laughs> having spent the last 20 years trying to create these programs and spaces that are publicly accessible to all ages but teens in particular and that's my core demographic is 14 and up so i feel strongly about um it's part of the reason why we work in residence it's not enough to visit we need to be there and on, a, on a consistent basis the programs that i run are in the school for fall and spring sessions 30 weeks out of the year Wow. And we're working to develop after school, out of school time and summer intensives, because I think I believe in wraparound. It's got to be available all the time. And um, we're also partnering, part, partner, partnering with the um, Office of Special Programs College Prep that works across nine community areas um, surrounding the Chicago footprint to really commit to students for two years with the um, singular goal of supporting them academically to get into the college of their choice. Right. So I think um, when this, when I've heard that that was an office on campus, I was like, hmm, how can how can we work together? Because I work in residence at schools that overlap with yours. And so I think there's a whole lot of coalition building um, in Chicago that I think is not always as instituted as it mm -hmm. should be, which is why I feel strongly about working within institutions. And I do a lot of other things, but when people ask me, people sometimes ask me, since you're doing all these other things, why do you focus so intently on youth work? But I think one of the most impactful the most impactful policy work you can be doing is working with young people. So it's, it's literally tomorrow, right? You're informing tomorrow when you create opportunities for youth. So I, now on record, I'm saying, who wants in? <laughs> who wants in um, if you want to develop anything? Because we are actively working on developing um, a pipeline program and design capacities. So um, if people are interested in that, um, I got five on it, <laughs> say that now. We will connect after this call. Yeah, Let's... I got five on it for Chicago youth. Um, now, let me get back on, on task. I had to get that in for my kids, but <laughs> let me get back on task. Uh, this next question is aimed at, um, let me find my bearings, it's aimed at Tony. 
uh, you know, the underpinnings, and we've started to get into this already, but the underpinning that lies at the foundation of, of any design for social good is a moral imperative. And the idea that, um, that questions that design can answer also act as a response to social issues and the problems that we face in an inequitable world. And um, when you place the words just cities side by side, that um, I never heard those words together in that way, but um, it's, it reminds me very much of the moral imperative built into social, you know, de design for social good. Um, and thinking uh, instinctively about that sort of dual effect, my brain does one, one of two things. It thinks about justice and it thinks about policy and how those things work together to create space where we do feel comfortable or where we don't feel comfortable, where we do feel like we have opportunity or where we don't feel like we have opportunity. So I, I wanted to open the question to you, to you, Tony, and ask what attributes um, would you describe um, should, you know, typify, could typify a city that is just, if we could break that down into sort of the practical, um, you know, architecture, you know, as Maurice was talking about a full court, right, a full basketball court, what would it look like to think about just cities and what does that look like as a practical um, series of spaces or functions that we, that tell us, that signal to us that we're in a just space? Um, <laughs> uh complicated answer, but let me try to be brief and then unpack it. Um, we created something called the Just City Index. It is 50 values that um, we have crowdsourced and, and put together as a framework for cities, communities, organizations to define what justice means for them with more specific and nuanced language to their particular place. The injustice that happens on the south side of Chicago is not the same as the injustice that may be happening in Oakland, that may be happening in Bolivia, that may be happening in Joburg, that may be happening in London, right? So we created it because I found the universality of talking about equity, sustainability, and resiliency too limiting and was not really sufficient for Black folks to articulate what it meant to be in a system that was unjust. And therefore, to sit across the table with someone like me in the work that I was doing in the, when I was in the public sector and otherwise, and be armed with the vocabulary to really discuss what justice meant in that particular context. So first, let me say, I don't think there is a one size fits all just city. I think it is very prescriptive and specific to context. With that said, and just to kind of tag this on to the previous conversation around black space, one of my favorite and I think most essential values for just city for black folks in black space is ownership. Material ownership and non-material ownership. So ownership of process, right? Ownership of voice and rights, you know, how we participate in the own making of our black space is paramount to the security of our being a part of that change and that future and lessening the vulnerabilities that we have. Material ownership, we have to own the assets, right? Whether that is owning the building, owning the process, owning you know, the real estate, owning the business, owning the home. That is the way in which we build household and community wealth. And with wealth is stability. With stability is flexibility and with flexibility is freedom. Right? And so to me, the way in which we get to something that is more just has to be anchored in the various types of ways we find ownership in the way in which we create the future environments that we want to situate ourselves in. So what's great, been great about the index, we've, we've used it to develop master classes, we've used it in workshops in Joburg, in Rotterdam, Amsterdam, in Cambridge, uh, in Chicago. Um, is that we find it really interesting that depending on what part of your world you're in, certain values may resonate louder or differently. Justice for the north side of Chicago is going to be different from justice on the south and west side of Chicago, right? So there cannot be this singular way that we think about that. You've got to look at the injustice of people in place and then begin to um, articulate the aspiration for justice. And, and just to say lastly, this work came about for me. Um, I was asked to um, 
be the first director of a design center at the City College of New York named after a role model, an important role model of both me and Maurice, um, J. Max Bond, a very prolific black architect uh, in the United States. And he saw architecture as a social art that had to address people in place. And so my intention for the center in terms of creating an agenda for what it could as a design made meaningful impacts on social and spatial justice. And I have you know, spent the last eight years just interrogating that question and asking others to interrogate it and even just you know, weigh in on, is there such thing as a just city? Can we get to it? It kind of gets back to that utopian conversation. And so it's been really fantastic at the way in which we've developed um, information on that. Thank you for putting the website in the chat. Um, and others have also found ways to pursue the notion of, of what that can mean. I want to open that question up uh, to the other panelists uh, and add maybe another layer around, um, it really resonates with me what you were saying about, about wealth, about um, you know, material and non-material wealth and a sense of ownership over a tangible objects or a process. And that makes me think, like, want to reverse engineer one step back and think about, well, what tools do we need to arrive at um, this ownership, right? This concept of ownership, whether it be material mm -hmm. or um, sort of uh, in a meta way, you know, in a philosophical way. Uh, I, I think I want to ask the same question of the other two panelists, but think more tangibly about how do we arrive at ownership? Um, let's explore that because I feel like it's, we all, we kind of have these ideas of where we want to get to, right? The utopia we want to arrive at, at, at minimum by proximity to the issue, right? I know this isn't what I want. Um, but I think we uh, stay in many dialogues in that space, in this reactionary space. And I, and I love, I would love to foster in this moment, a deeper conversation around like, how do we get to this ownership you're talking about? What are the tools we need? Brandy. Here. I want to hear you. you. <laughs> um, so, you know, I think me being on the panel, I'm not a practitioner. And so for me, it's more looking at looking through a particular lens to understand cities. And so this concept that, you know, Tony's talking about in terms of the specificity of the place is really important. And to be honest with you, I've been thinking a lot about how we actually have to rethink ownership and rethink property. Because, you know, in different locations, like, and so I am using Oakland as an example, because I'm very familiar with it. Um, but in Oakland, you know, we're seeing the Moms for Housing movement and ways that Black women who are mothers, um, took, who are homeless, um, took over an unoccupied home that was owned by an investor, right? An investment company that's not locally based. And so if we think about kind of traditional concepts of property and ownership, technically they shouldn't have that place, right? But it's this idea that we have to upend what we mean by kind of acquisition and thinking about what's wealth in our communities by also not attaching it in the same way to capital, right? And not making it so that we have to build forms of wealth that oftentimes exclude some people who probably aren't going to have as much money as others. And so I think it's really important to um, also consider how we are not a monolith. And so the diversity of Black people in this world requires us to think also differently about how we have these different ways of living. So this utopia that we want to reach is that we can just be however we want to be. We can be amazing. We can be super mediocre. We can be whatever we want, right? We don't always have to be kind of striving for a particular type of achievement. And sorry, a cat on my desk. Um, <laughs> But also just thinking about how wealth already exists in the Black community. So it's more so how do we really think about expanding our notions of what wealth we already have. So I think there are various ways people are doing that, especially now, you know, we're experiencing, you know, the Black Spring and, and revolution, or at least potential for it, that, you know, various practices of, you know, mutual aid or understanding ways that we don't necessarily have to rely on, you know, single family homes, but thinking about living collectively might be 
an opportunity for us to build various forms of wealth. So I, I think even in kind of relating to the conversation previously, it's about also understanding that we have experts in our community. So in addition to having more Black youth become planners, become architects, become city leaders, et cetera, that they necessarily draw on the wealth and the knowledge that already exists in these communities and not have a whole bunch of people tell them what they should do. Um, the, the last thing I'll say about that too is that I think it's important for us to understand kind of history. So also as we're thinking about wealth accumulation, we have to think about the ways that, that wealth was extracted from us. So every time we gain, there are ways that the state in a variety of ways has successfully and continued to attempt to take from us. And so how do we form these creative solutions where there isn't that, that their ease, right? There's not the ease for the state to come and take that opportunity to take away from us. So yeah, I, I, in terms of how to do it, it's more so honestly a reconceptualization and then also historicizing, like knowing where we came from and then also how do we look to the future without trying to recreate, produce something new when the, 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 the foundation is already there. Mm -hmm. I would add to that before it's, uh... Uh, Maurice, I definitely want you to weigh in, but I would add to that, this is a, a perfect reference to Amanda Williams. And so much of the work of Amanda Williams, who's a, a local you know, Chicago artist, Chicago native, um, I, I definitely think if you are interested in those ideas and everything Brandy just said, um, that you should definitely look into sort of the theoretical and very tangible sort of artwork um, of Amanda Williams. It is very much about the state, about value, about reconsidering, you know, value within Black communities, recognizing it within Black wealth within communities in different ways. Um, Can I just jump in really quickly? And when you mentioned um, Amanda Williams before, I wanted to like kind of do my this, you know, the little, um, oh, I can't even do it. Usually you have the option to do this clapping or whatever. <laughs> Anywho, specifically because I think with Amanda's work, being an artist, but having this architectural training, that she does have this way of engaging theory and understanding how color and aesthetics as it relates to the Black experience and this very everyday Black experience can still be literally painted on a structure that's been deemed un uninhabitable mm -hmm. or these places that aren't necessarily permanent, but kind of playing with permanence, right? And still creating this very Black space without it necessarily being occupied. So anyway, I wanted to I forgot that I wanted to say that. Okay, that's it. Sorry. Go ahead, Maurice. <laughs> no, no. I, I mean, I love this um, conversation. And I'm think it, I, I approach it in two, two different ways. Uh, one is the uh, definition of ownership and, and developing a ownership model that's inclusive, that goes beyond your single family home ownership, which we all understand. Uh, and start to talk about how do we, how do we own the coffee shop down the block? How do we own the building that the coffee shop exists in? And how do you find ways that ordinary people could have an equity share in something that seems really far uh, distant from them, a mixed use building in your neighborhood? We have to stop wanting the Starbucks. We have to like, want to own the Starbucks and own the building that the Starbucks is in. And in order to do that, you've got to create a climate where um, entrepreneurs and developers can emerge uh, and find a, um, a welcoming environment. Uh, and so, you know, I've been talking about creating opportunities for development in black and brown neighborhoods on the south side and west side of of town and I intend for them to be developed by black developers and brown developers. I intend the architects who design those buildings to be of color. Uh, and then I expect the tenants who will be the anchors in those buildings to also be of color. And so you start realizing, well, I, I have to get to all of these different components that build local wealth. Uh, and we are starting um, to see what has to happen. New networks have to for, uh, form uh, to support them. And I'll just, I'll just uh, cite an example. So in Invest Southwest, Opportunity South on the South, on the south Side of Chicago, you know, this is like a $20 million in, uh, investment in maybe one single parcel to do a building. Well, 
um, in order to get a developer who can do that, you have to start working with the commercial real estate community of minority developers and figure out how you can create a network where they can support each other and have access to capital. Uh, in order for those black developers to hire black architects, well, you've got to create a, a pre-qualified list to say, if you use these black and brown architects, we're going to reward you. And so you, we partnered and created uh, an amazing list uh, that is majority women and majority uh, minority owned design firms. And then, well, what about the developer who has to um, come up with $75,000 of pre-development pre funds uh, to go after that RP. Well, you work with the Chicago Community Trust to create a pre-development fund. Um, so all the public did was create the opportunity to kind of set a goal of creating black wealth that stays in this community. And then you got all of these other components that have to fall in place. And I would argue that if, if, uh, if those communities didn't have someone on the inside, who was advocating at every step of the way, then our work would be that much harder. Because, uh, um, and I, I always, feel, I mean, you know, here I am, the commissioner of planning and development in Chicago, but I always feel like somehow I got in and people didn't quite know um, what uh, I was going to do. <laughs> and then lo and behold, I'm just looking at the whole system. So I think that's an important part of the ownership model. Um, and we're thinking about it constantly. Uh, I thought Tony's point about you have to own the process, you have to own the tools, you have to own everything. And, and to do that, you gotta, you gotta find ways into the room where it's happening and advocate for those who may not have a seat at the table uh, and keep that door open. This is so great. I wanna stop being the moderator and just watch this <laughs> right now. <laughs> Forget it, I was supposed to moderate. Because I, I, as someone who has worked you know, in neighborhoods for 20 years, you, uh, I realized as someone who was an artist who was interested in bringing you know, creativity and, like, and, and igniting the black radical imagination in young people, that um, that's that's so much that that could lead to so much more, which is why my collaborators tend to be people who are not always visual artists, but also social thinkers and social actors. So um, I definitely uh, am enjoying all the different ways that you all are thinking about um, how to approach your work, and um, this leads beautifully into our last section of the conversation before we open up into Q and A called "Beautiful Solutions," um, and this question is directed back at you, uh, Mr. Cox. Um, because one of the hallmarks of the Bauhaus, just using that as our anchor throughout, is just this idea of forward looking, mm -hmm. right? Of experimentation, of innovation, of constantly sort of taking the new information to inform a process and to send that back out. You've done so many things. <laughs> you, you've accomplished so many things and I think been a contributor to, to so many communities of thought around how to enhance or advance communities. Uh, one of the things that, that stuck out at, at me and that I thought was sort of distinguished was just your work with the National Endowment of the Arts as the director of design and how you were consulting with mayors all over the country mm -hmm. around the role that design can play in their cities. And I'm wondering whether or not, um, I kind of want to know just as a fly on the wall, what was it like to be having that, that's, such a spectrum of conversation about problem solving using design and what were the most um, innovative solutions that you were seeing people implement in their communities? Yeah, well, I mean, I, I mean, Tony has served a number of mayors as well. So she knows um, a little bit how they think. They're incredibly focused and incredibly demanding uh, and want, um, they're kind of very results driven they don't like this abstract stuff. They like <laughs> tangible, this is a place, this is a street, this is a riverfront, how are we gonna change? And they put a political timeline on it. So I wanna see change in four years. You know, it's gotta happen now, you know? So it, there's an immediacy um, and, a, and a concreteness about um, their expectations that I think is perfect for architects who like like to make stuff and it's not complete until something is made but um so hearing them as well um their quick study uh they're incredibly articulate 
Um, so for example, I'm gonna use uh, Mayor Lightfoot uh, as a case in point. Um, she says, you know, Maurice, I wanna create a Marshall Plan for the South Side and the West Side of Chicago. And I was like, oh my God, a Marshall Plan. I mean, from soup to nuts, she's talking about transformation. And it just gave you an immediate sense of her aspirations and that like, make no little plans. She's like, I want to change the course of development on the South Side and the West Side. And so you've got to you gotta figure out how do I make that real? I mean, how do I operationalize this? It can't stay some big abstract plan that costs billions and billions of dollars. It has to be tangible evidence. And she wants to know, like, what am I going to see in 12 months in my Marshall Plan? What am I going to see in 18 months? What am I going to see in two years? <laughs> Not like 20 years. And so I, I, you know, so I tend to be really concrete. It's a site, it's a place, it's a community. Um, it's, it's not just, um, it can't stay in the conceptual level. And so that's, that's been my experience. It's just made me, you know, one foot in the here and now and the other foot like in 20 years from now. And I'm constantly going back and forth between the reality of trying to bring an entire community along for the ride so that they uh, feel ownership of, at the same time, taking them to a place that they had never imagined possible. Uh, and that's, that's a dance. I, I play it every day. How do you get people to be inspired and believe in transformation? But you can, you can show them the steps that you can take now um, that lead to this longer uh, transformation. So. Yeah, uh, you, you learn that when you work with mayors, right, Tony? <laughs> well, what's interesting, and you know, the first time I realized that it was really mayors that were the designers of cities is um, when I switched from architecture to urban planning and we were getting ready for the DNC convention on the west side. And Mayor Daly was rabid about, and this is kind of the near-term example, um, of how do we not have cameras panning the West Side and it looked like we had just left 1968, right? Which it kind of did. <laughs> but what was interesting to me, um, um, despite any differencing of opinions that you have about Mayor Daly, and I lived through two of them, um, is that he was a real student of urban design and city making. Uh, just as Mayor Williams was in DC, which allowed us to do the plan for H Street and U Street and, and have really thoughtful processes that try to bake some of that black in place uh, into place that uh, Brandy writes about. Um, but when you have a mayor that really does understand their role and their agency, and then creates an infrastructure of, of um, staff and resources to enable people like Maurice and I to do that work. There is nothing like it. And so the part of one of the programs that was um, under Maurice's purview called the Mayor's Institute on City Design is this thing that brings mayors together in this closed door session. They have to present a project in front of a group of designers and get feedback and learn the, and the whole premise of it is for that leadership to really value the role of design and place making and place keeping and what development and design and art should really be contributing to places in their city. I right now I'm hosting one of those mayor institutes. Um, yeah. It's the first Just City Fellowship Awesome. Of Institute that we're doing in this space of COVID. And so we have seven mayors and for the first time, it's a cohort of all black mayors. Wow. Um, and part of what they're examining through this, this curriculum is using um, the site of a black neighborhood in their city and actually talking through the notion of justice, the role of design, helping them think through when you fuse those two things together what does their design and development agenda have to look like differently? And the other thing I'll say is when you get a mayor who appreciates this, as Maurice and I have both been fortunate enough to work uh, with mayors who get it, is that yes, they are like 
I need it yesterday and they're very outcome oriented and they're very short term focused. But if they really care about this, they're also thinking about their legacy and the legacy that they're leaving on the city. So when I was deputy director in Washington, D.C., and then planning director in Newark, New Jersey with Cory Booker, the idea that we can work near term and long term simultaneously is fantastic. And that's when you really yeah. understand that the mayor, that leadership really understands the role that this function plays for them uh, and the work that they're doing every day, <laughs> um, as well as, you know, I think it's a signal of their deep care for the city when they're also allowing you to look at the long-term trajectory of their city. Because, you know, these neighborhoods did not get this way overnight and they ain't gonna change overnight, right? It's a block by block and it requires not just the leadership of the public sector, it requires the nonprofits, grassroots organization. It, it requires anchor institutions and, and partners within the academy. It requires the block club. I mean, it requires the corporate sector to lean into the notion of a just city um, in order to get the outcomes that we want in the near and long term. Wow, that's, uh, to be honest, it's like, uh, so we need to do this convening, like, can we do this every Wednesday? And <laughs> just take notes so that people understand how, where we need to be going. Um, but also, you, Tony, you just beautifully responded to what my, like, sort of follow-up question was going to be about these tools, you know, like opening up to the large group, what tools are needed. Mm -hmm. I also just think, you know, it's a, a radical imagination is needed, and fostering that yes. in people of all ages is also... I feel like I work at the wide mouth of the funnel trying to create an, an interest and inquiry around that and people's role and, and having a say, right? And, and also just consciousness raising, right? You have a voice um, yep. around which you can imagine, you can sort of place yourself within a narrative around which you can start to build the world you want to see. Um, I would love to go on another 30 minutes just listening to you all talk about, you know, just throw out names like Cory Booker and whatnot. <laughs> But uh, I want to open up, uh, we'll respond with some of the questions that have come up. Um, there's a beautiful question that I think um, is re reflected because some of the notes are telling me like who the question is for, but I think this is for the whole panel. But Brandy, you may, not to put you on the spot, you may have some thoughts about this. But this question is, and I'll read it out loud, Rashad Shabazz talks about carceral spaces in his book, Spatializing Blackness. I'd like to hear your perspective about using design to center restorative justice to remedy these carceral design legacies in our cities. Are there aesthetics of restorative justice? Thank you for this conversation. Thanks for that question. Yes, I'm, I'm familiar with the book. Um, I remember I read it as soon as it came out. Uh, what was that, 2015? So, you know, I think with the Shabazz book, what he does really well is what I mentioned earlier, historicized. So understanding how certain structures specifically in Chicago and thinking about the Robert Taylor homes and thinking about, you know, kitchenettes um, and their history and understanding how black people were living in kitchenettes versus those in the kind of post-war, well, really pre-war, post-war period um, were living in kitchenettes in terms of modernizing the city, right? So if we're, we're talking about a just city right now, there was a way in which the city was built for the inhabitants that, you know, cities wanted to come and live there. And so, you know, I think in terms of carceral spaces, what's important are the ways that, like the title suggests, how race, specifically Blackness, is spatialized um, based on various practices. And I think that goes to that last question that you were asking, Camilla, about, um, about mayors in that they have a really, really tough job in that ultimately a lot of them are interested in growing the city, right? Whether that be in terms of making additional money, um, bringing more funds to the city, but also growing its population. But what ends up happening is oftentimes the people who have been there the longest don't necessarily fit into that plan. And so it's hard to create policy or at least to produce opportunities for the people whose lives don't necessarily fit the, you know, particular economic force that's happening. For example, like with technology or thinking about like the gig economy and these ways that the economy is shifting so rapidly that folks that have lived in cities like Chicago, like San Francisco, like Washington DC may not keep up with what's going on in terms of this transition. So I think there are ways that design, you know, it's important to not only be able to make 
space or make structures, but also unmake them. And so figuring out kind of how architects and planners have to do the opposite of what they're supposed to do and understand how what's been built already might actually be um, traumatizing the communities that they're hopefully helping and instead need to unmake some of the structures that have been, you know, if we think about Le Corbusier or we think about like New York has its own sordid history in terms of what's happened, but incorporating, you know, planners like, I, I, you know, I know Jane Jacobs has been so popular um, for a lot of planners, especially like um, in generations previously, but thinking about, again, these everyday uses of space and how allowing people to be in public. I know Maurice was talking a little bit earlier about parks, right? So this idea that you can be in a park is wonderful. Also make sure that these kids are not surveilled, that police aren't always there, right? So it's whatever of what of Ah, whatever other structures or whatever other institutions are also collaborating to make sure that these spaces are inhabitable for Black people specifically. So I think in terms of this carceral kind of the carceral aesthetics or understanding kind of these carceral structures, this is the part where you have to dismantle, not necessarily just continue to build. And sometimes we kind of just need to, to chill um, <laughs> and let, let the space be without coming up with ideas on how to bring people. People will come. It's just a matter of kind of producing an opportunity for them to make their own places. Are there any other uh, thoughts from the panel around that question? Well, Camila, I was, um, I was adding some links in the chat, not in the Q&A. Uh, and, and to that question in particular, I just wanted to introduce the attendees to Deanna Van Buren's work, uh, who's in the Oaken area, um, designing justice, designing spaces, who is doing just what Brandy said, which is the deconstruction of that carceral architecture and spaces and programming, and is working right now in Atlanta um, in doing just that on a specific uh, um, a place of imprisonment in thinking not only about the architecture world disruption, but really the disruption of how we um, deal with criminally involved people um, and their families uh, and their reintegration into neighborhoods. So their whole um, firm, which is a nonprofit, by the way, not a for-profit company, is designed to do just that. So she's dismantling how we do architecture as a practice and also taking on this work in a really specific way. Can we, uh, just to confirm with the, with the design museum, can we somehow capture all these links um, in the chat? I wanna make sure that like, you know, we have a reading list to do our homework. Because um, a lot of- a lot add, of We'll definitely capture them. Yeah, can we add a link to uh, Brandy's book? I wanna read it. So can you like put something in chat so I can capture that? Sure. I have it right here. Can't see it. <laughs> <laughs> okay. which, I, which I've had for a year. So I didn't just buy it. You have been on my, um, if you look at my Instagram, you will see it on my bookshelf. So, oh my God. Um, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> You'll be speaking at my gentrification class this spring. Happy <laughs> to. Consider it a, a formal invitation. And uh, I just want to, if I could, I know we're out of time, um, but I just want to maybe in my final comment, make uh, one more example. And it links to a question that was also in the Q&A about this notion of belonging that um, Maurice talked about. And so as I started, you know, I grew up on the South side of Chicago. Um, so my world was very black, going downtown was a very, uh, uh, special and different thing. And then, you know, going to college, my world was the exact opposite in, in Notre Dame, right? So I lived in these different worlds. And by being one of the few licensed architects in the United States, you know, I continue to sort of live that way. So Chicago is this place where the center of the city is really one of the few places where you can be in an environment and see people who look different from you. You know, I'm not the only one that grew up in a segregated city. The white folks who live on the north side grew up in a segregated city too, but they're not conditioned or socialized to think of themselves as growing up in a segregated city, right? Mm -hmm. But each of us did, right? And there are very few neighborhoods, as I'm sure Maurice is learning, oh, yes. that are mixed race in the city. After college, I moved to Hyde Park for that reason. Yeah. The only place I could find back then to go. So when, Crown, when a Millennium Park was built, and Crown Fountain opened. 
you know, I almost wept some of the first times I went there because it is the few, one of the few places in the city where you're just kind of hanging out on the side. You're watching all these little kids, black, brown, green, yellow, playing with each other. And then all of a sudden you start to see their parents, you know, looking for their kids, then talking to the kid, the parents of the kid, right? That doesn't happen in Chicago every day, hardly at all, right? You are in mixed company when you're at work and then you go home, right, to your segregated part of town. And I think one of the reasons that Crown is so successful is not only because of the way in which it allows you to kind of stomp around in the water, uh, not thinking about who's next to you, but there are these giant digital towers of everyday faces of Chicago. And I mean every day. <laughs> it's not just the beautiful people. It's everyday Chicagoan. So if you're like a little black boy who doesn't have a reason to go downtown and therefore doesn't, but all of a sudden you go and you see a face that looks just like yours, that's a signal of belonging. What are the visual cues? Right? And it doesn't have to be that literal always, right? It can be being in a park and there are not cameras on you and you don't know what the camera is. But those things send signals to whether or not you are a person that belongs. And, and you have to understand that by also understanding that there has been a system that has intentionally been designed to keep people out of certain spaces and places. And if you don't acknowledge that's part of our history mm. as a way of then trying to work on the ways of creating belonging, you are likely to miss the mark. Both of those have to be understood if we're to be successful in the practices of creating spaces that engender real true belonging. You've got to understand the ways in which that system has not been set up to allow us to do that. And they're very specific in some cases. So that, that's my specific example of one of the spaces in Chicago mm. that I think successfully does that. I think this connects actually really closely with a question in the chat around um, if people don't mind going just a little bit over because I want to some of these questions are really good and I want to make sure that we ask them of the panel but one of them is uh, in the wake of uprisings many cities are exploring how to be anti-racist you know as cities but this still centers racism and oppression how do we move from being anti-racist to being a city that is centered on values um, that are pro-black um, how do we I, it just says radical imagination, question mark. But I think, how do you foster the radical imagination? So I think, Tony, to your point, you're talking about these visual cues, right? It's that, um, that tell people that if everybody belongs, right? This sort of, this monumental, this, that's, that installation is monumental in its scope. It's in the center of the city. It does show every face. And those are faces of Chicagoans that is, that is right. across the spectrum of identity. So that's a visual cue. Um, but what are some other, you know, cues, what are some other components of what it looks like to be anti-racist as a city? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I feel really uh, strongly that it's about acknowledging our contributions, um, our like historic contributions that are always and very often um, embedded in the everyday. So for example, in West Englewood, um, um, the house that Emmett Till and his mother uh, lived in. We just um, passed uh, an ordinance to create uh, and make it an historic site. Uh, and, you know, the reason why it came to folks' attention is because a speculator, a, a white guy, bought it, not knowing the historic significance of this house. Uh, and when he bought it, it triggered a whole series of other community resources to immediately jump into action. So uh, a nonprofit, uh, Blacks in Green, um, stepped in. Uh, the local alderman stepped in. Uh, long story short, um, Blacks in Green bought that house. Uh, and the city gave them the two vacant lots next door to it to create a memory garden. Uh, and this is just another two-story house along a street that has a seminal role in civil rights history. And our job is to um, harness that, to put it into a network of other sites of memory throughout that, uh, that's, uh, that community that make tell a larger story, literally about the Black migration from like Mississippi to Chicago. And so 
I um I'm always uh you know if if blacks and green had not been there and wanted to be uh, an interpreter if we didn't have a black older woman who said you know we need to make this happen if we didn't have a black commissioner you know that opportunity would have just fallen uh, to the wayside uh, the other part about what does it mean to have an artist in every conversation about the built environment of a black neighborhood uh, to help curate and find the radical innovation uh, embedded in everything from like redoing the sidewalks uh, to how a storefront uh, might look. So I feel um, if we're gonna get to something that's celebratory, if we're gonna get something that um, looks at these communities as full of assets and not deficient, uh, we're gonna have to surround them with um, folks who understand the inherent power of them and have some ability to interpret what a community says and sees. Uh, so it's a mixture of like the deep knowledge of the person who's lived in the neighborhood for generations and bringing to the fore the creative uh, resources, other black and brown um, creative people who know how to listen and how to interpret um, their aspirations. And I often think of myself as like a, a ghost writer. I'm there to help Mrs. Harris down the block tell her story. And I can turn it into bricks and mortar. I can turn it into a physical place, but only she can have that vision. Uh, and so I always come to communities and because I grew up in a black community, I've always desired uh, to work in our communities exclusively because I have found us and you know, to be extraordinarily creative people. Uh, and if you approach our community with the same creative impulse that they uh, approach getting dressed in the morning, uh, then you will come up with something spectacular. Uh, and so, uh, I, I mean, I love, uh, I love our community and I think about um, it as being the beloved community that against all, um, all kinds of adverse adversity uh, has, um, is still there, uh, incredibly resilient. Uh, and it, it warrants all of our creative um, forces uh, to be there with them. So I'll stop there. Brandy, did you want to add any thoughts to that question? Sure. Um, you know, I, I think that's a great question. And, and I don't know if um, the person asking was was referencing Cedric Robinson when thinking about a um, Black radical tradition, but um, it, it made me think about um, Cedric Robinson and thinking about how, you know, this quest for an anti-racist city um, that does or that doesn't necessarily center um, racism or oppression. I mean, I'm not sure that you can't or can avoid it, right? Um, I think we do actually have to center racism and, and oppression. And so in thinking about, you know, what Cedric Robinson talked about, it was more so about, you know, centering Black di dignity um, and, and humanity. And so that still requires us to dismantle racist policy um, and also institutions, but it ends up being more about um, a politics, right? And so it doesn't necessarily have to do with the color of one's skin, but more so the black in black radical tradition still has to do with that kind of political commitment. And so I think again, to Robinson, he was thinking about, you know, this tradition, and I think it's really important for us to move forward as this collective consciousness that's really um, informed by historical struggles for liberation and this um, shared sense of obligation to really preserve our collective being or our um, sense of community. And, and that's what kind of can propel us forward. And so where I still think that we have to focus a bit on oppression and understanding how to dismantle racist policies and institutions is also recognizing what policies and institutions are racist. Sometimes it becomes so common and every day that we don't necessarily recognize when it's happening. And so that's where you do have to have this more interdisciplinary, interpractice work um, where it allows you to have those folks who do this work 
come and, and really kind of expose these opportunities for us to figure out how to work together. So in thinking about Millennial Park, and, and I've spent a lot of time there, I worked in an office building that overlooked the park. And so I remember for me, the amphitheater um, was most amazing um, because I was able to see these incredible acts, uh, musical acts, and then also to kind of look back to see how many different kinds of people were either, either purchased tickets to participate or at least to be um, viewers, but then also those who could hear from the street. So in a way, you know, you didn't necessarily have to be a direct participant, but you still were able to benefit from being around the amphitheater. And so I guess I'm thinking about it in more of that imagination, that it's more of an amphitheater that's outdoors that allows us to really kind of touch the folks who are outside of the boundaries and instead feel like they belong and are able to kind of hear the music that's coming through. So I, I'm, I'm with the person who asked the question in terms of us understanding the significance of coming together, but at the same time, I think we can do both at the same time. I love this conversation. I want to have it every day. I just, um, but we have to conclude. Um, I will add in one other um, agenda item of my own. Just, uh, Mr. Cox, I would love to talk to you about the Hansberry residence All right. and, and making Lorraine Hansberry's, um, uh, you know, the, 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 that, that property at the center of the Hansberry Supreme Court case. Yes. Recognizing that in yeah. some way, because certainly um, some of my students right now in our Office of Special Programs Saturday program are learning about um, Lorraine Hansberry's political papers, about her protest papers. So um, let's do it. Let's do okay. it. Contact me after the show. Yeah, I just was like, let me get that in there because I <laughs> wanted that house. <laughs> I wanted that house because it's it's such a central, um, it's it's so rich at the ways that you can get at that story, but also talk so much about redlining and sort of um, the systems of oppression that ha that connect to housing. And so I, I think it's a beautiful example yeah. that she as a playwright, we can continue to introduce to our students, but then Love also it. make connections to feelings of displacement in the actual architecture that they can identify with today. So um, FYI, I'll be shouting out at you. Um, thank you. Thank you to our panelists. Um, big virtual claps to Mr. Maurice Cox, Tony L. Griffin, Brandy T. Summers, PhD. This was really a highlight of my life <laughs> to talk to you because I, I think only really Norman and Folayemi know how much these things mean to me. Um, I moved to this city for the architecture um, I'm, and I'm an artist by trade and being able to kind of combine the two for our, for our young people, for our communities means so much to me. So the fact that you all referenced art <laughs> in public space on top of it was like such a win. Thank you so much for sharing your expertise, your experience, your energy. Thank you for so much that you do for our communities. We really need you. We really appreciate you. Thank you for, for creating scholarship around that to institute it so that other people can find it. So much of the legacy work is about leaving it so that we can pick it up, so we can find the record of it, so that we can model that behavior. So I just wanted to say thank you so much on behalf of really um, communities of color around the country that really need your thought work for us to advance equity um, and, and livable condi conditions overall. Um, is there anything else? Yes. For our audience, thank you for coming. I want to plug a few things. On November 12th, Dr. Summers will begin, um, will be a part of the 47th annual DC History Conference oh. <laughs> yeah. um, with, uh, the, uh, during the uh, Letitia, am, am I saying it right? Letitia Woods Brown Memorial Lecture. Dr. Summers will talk about traces of a chocolate city, blackness, urban aesthetics, and the politics of gentrification. The talk is gonna focus on the production of racial aesthetics through the management of black excess and the rapidly gentrifying H Street commercial corridor. And then on December 3rd, if you want more of the goodness we had today, you can also check out Ms. Griffin, um, who will be the keynote presenter at Reactivate, the Chicago Loop Alliance Foundation's virtual fundraiser to support the Chicago Loop Alliance Foundation and to inspire Chicagoans to return to the loop safely. If you join that event, you'll be able to glimpse some of the projects, programs, and people um, that have kept the loop going and that are gonna help the loop rebuild. So please, if you are interested in, in these people and their beautiful ideas, um, those are November 12th and December 3rd, you can catch them respectively. And that is Thank all. Thank you, Camilla, this was great. Thank you, Camilla, it was so wonderful to meet yeah. you. Thanks for- what a wonderful spirit. Absolutely amazing. <laughs> yeah, thank you everybody. I want to say, uh, 
Thank you so much for uh, uh, hosting this uh, Design Museum Chicago. Thank you, Brandy. Thank you, Tony. Thank you, Maurice. I look forward to your continued work around the country. Thank you, Folo, Folo uh, Wilson, for being a great partner. Uh, thank you, Lauren, for managing all of this and making it happen. I look forward to the next one. Thank you guys so much. Good night. Bye. 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 Thank you. Thank <laughs> you.